Hi, Dr. Alex here, and welcome to what I hope will be an enjoyable series to many people, although it may be of niche interest. Specifically, this series is transcribing the audiobooks of Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, Life, the Universe, and Everything, and So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, as read by Stephen Moore. Stephen Moore, for those who don't know, is the actor who played Marvin the Paranoid Android on the original radio production of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the TV series which followed soon after. This is the genuine Marvin the Paranoid Android, except no substitutes. When the radio series first aired in 1979, I was about five years old, and it was then repeated multiple times over several years on Radio 4, where it was first broadcast. My father was an avid fan of Hitchhikers as soon as it was produced, had the books, which I still have copies of, and listened to the radio series repeatedly, as did I growing up, to the point where I think I overtook my father in terms of my fandom for the series and would insist that we listen to it whenever it was on, on a Saturday usually, around about lunchtime, and it just had to be on in the background so I could listen to it. Later, in school, having consumed the radio series multiple times and the books, I discovered the audiobooks in the school library, as read by Stephen Moore. And of course, I got these out and listened to them repeatedly as long as I could. Obviously, I had to take them back. They were, after all, library books on tape. Recently, I got to thinking about these books on tape and how enjoyable they were. Being read by Stephen Moore, it had the voice of Marvin the Paranoid Android whenever he read the Marvin lines. And of course, the correct voice for the other characters that he also read in the radio series. And simply as a narrator, he has an excellent reading voice. So I remembered how much I enjoyed those as a child and then thought, I wonder if they're still readily available. As it turns out, they are not. They have never been produced on DVD or online. They only exist in that original tape form. And those tapes themselves are incredibly hard to find, as I discovered as I attempted to dig them out online from various shops and sources. I have now got all but one of the books. And hopefully by the time I get to the last book that Stephen Moore read, I should have all the tapes available. I would like to stress I do not own the copyright for these tapes. I do not own the copyright for the original material and I'm recording them in these videos in an effort to preserve them because they are on magnetic tape. Magnetic tape degrades and there aren't very many of them left around as far as I can see and there's been no effort to reproduce these professionally in another format, either online digitally or even just on CD. So if you do own the copyright for these please by all means copyright claim these videos as the material is your own but I would request humbly that you do not block them, just monetize them. My channel isn't monetized, so I'm not going to make money from this anyway, but I would like people, future generations, to be able to access these amazing recordings and enjoy Stephen Moore's work long into the future. Anyway, enough about my motivations for doing this, and now here is The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, Cassette, Side 2. A short while later, he was running across the plain in the direction of the ruined city. The elation of his recent experience was still with him, though. The whole universe. He had seen the whole universe stretching to infinity around him. Everything. And with it had come the clear and extraordinary knowledge that he was the most important thing in it. Having a conceited ego is one thing. Actually being told by a machine is another. He didn't have time to reflect on this matter. Gargavar had told him that he would have to alert his masters as to what had happened, but that he was prepared to leave a decent interval before doing so, enough time for Zephod to make a break and find somewhere to hide. After a while the remains of a wide sweeping road led off from the one down which he was walking, and at its end lay a vast low building surrounded with sundry smaller ones, the whole surrounded by the remains of a perimeter barrier. He approached the building. Along one side of it, the front, it would seem, since it faced a wide concreted apron area, were three gigantic doors, maybe sixty feet high. The far one of these was open, and towards this Zaphod ran. Inside all was gloom, dust, and confusion. Giant cobwebs lay over everything. Through the heavy gloom huge shapes loomed, covered with debris. 
They were all spacecraft, all derelict. Towards the rear of the building lay one old ship, slightly larger than the others, and buried beneath even deeper piles of dust and cobwebs. Its outline, however, seemed unbroken. He stared at the ship in disbelief. His heart was beating fast. He rummaged feverishly amongst the debris lying on the floor all about him and found a short length of tubing and a non-biodegradable plastic cup. Out of this he fashioned a crude stethoscope and placed it against the side of the ship. What he heard made his brains turn somersaults. Transtellar Cruise Lines would like to apologize to passengers for the continuing delay to this flight. We are currently awaiting the loading of our complement of small lemon-soaked paper napkins for your comfort, refreshment and hygiene during the journey. Meanwhile, we thank you for your patience. The cabin crew will shortly be serving coffee and biscuits again. Zaphod staggered backwards, staring wildly at the ship. He walked around for a few moments in a daze. Two minutes later, he was on board. Suddenly a door opened and a figure stepped out in front of him. Please return to your seat, sir, said the android stewardess, and turning her back on him, she walked on down the corridor in front of him. He followed her through the door. They were now in the passenger compartment, and Zaphod's heart stopped still again for a moment. In every seat sat a passenger, strapped into his or her seat. The passenger's hair was long and unkempt, their fingernails were long, the men wore beards. All of them were quite clearly alive, but sleeping. Zaphod had the creeping horrors. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for bearing with us during this slight delay. We will be taking off as soon as we possibly can. If you would like to wake up now, I will serve you coffee and biscuits. There was a slight hum. At that moment, all the passengers awoke. They awoke screaming and clawing at the straps and life support systems that held them tightly in their seats. Then one of them rose from his seat. He turned and looked at Zaphod. Zaphod's skin was crawling all over his body as if it was trying to get off. He turned and ran from the bedlam. He plunged through the door and back into the corridor. The man pursued him. He raced in a frenzy to the end of the corridor, through the entrance chamber and beyond. He arrived on the flight deck, slammed and bolted the door tight behind him. He leant back against the door, breathing hard. Within seconds, a hand started beating on the door. From somewhere on the flight deck, a metallic voice addressed him. Passengers are not allowed on the flight deck. Please return to your seat and wait for the ship to take off. Coffee and biscuits are being served. This is your autopilot speaking. Please return to your seat. I am not a passenger. Please return to your seat. I am not a passenger. Please return to your seat. I am not a... Hello, you're the autopilot. Yes. You're in charge of this ship? Yes. There has been a delay. Passengers are to be kept temporarily in suspended animation for their comfort and convenience. Coffee and biscuits are served every year, after which passengers are returned to suspended animation for their continued comfort and convenience. Departure will take place when the flight stores are complete. We apologize for the delay. Zaphod moved away from the door, on which the pounding had now ceased. He approached the flight console. Delay? But at that moment the door opened. Zaphod span round to see the man who had pursued him standing there. He carried a large briefcase. He was smartly dressed, and his hair was short. He had no beard and no long fingernails. Zaphod Beeblebrox, my name is Zani Whoop. I believe you wanted to see me. Oh, man, oh, man, where did you spring from? I've been waiting here for you. What's going on? Very simple. I discovered the coordinates at which this man could be found, uh, the man who rules the universe, and discovered that his world was protected by an improbability field. To protect my secret and myself, I retreated to the safety of this totally artificial universe and hid myself away in a forgotten cruise liner. I was secure. Meanwhile, you and I... You and I... You mean I knew you? Yes, we knew each other well. I had no taste. Meanwhile, you and I arranged that you would steal the improbability drive ship, the only one which could reach the ruler's world and bring it to me here. This you have now done, I trust, and I congratulate you. He smiled a tight little smile which Zaphod wanted to hit with a brick. 
Oh, and in case you were wondering, this universe was created specifically for you to come to. You are therefore the most important person in this universe. You would never have survived the total perspective vortex in the real one. Shall we go? Where? To your ship, the Heart of Gold. You did bring it, I trust? No. Where is your jacket? My jacket? I took it off. It's outside. Good. We'll go and find it. Zani Whoop held up a silencing finger as the hatchway swung open. A few feet away from them they could see Zaphod's jacket lying in the debris. A very remarkable and very powerful ship. Watch. As they watched, the pocket on the jacket suddenly bulged. It split. It ripped. The small metal model of the heart of gold that Zaphod had been bewildered to discover in his pocket was growing. It grew. It continued to grow. It reached after two minutes. Its full size. Zephot swayed. You mean that I had it with me all the time? Oh, yes, of course. That was the whole point. That's it. You can count me out. From here on in, you can count me out. I've had all I want of this. You play your own games. I'm afraid you cannot leave. You are entwined in the improbability field. You cannot escape. He smiled the smile that Zaphod had wanted to hit, and this time Zaphod hit it. Ford Prefect bounded up to the bridge of the Heart of Gold. Trillian! Arthur! It's working! The ship's reactivated! Trillian and Arthur were asleep on the floor. Come on, you guys, we're going! We're off! Hi there, guys! It's really great to be back with you again, I can tell you, and I just want to say that... Shut up! Tell us where the hell we are! Frogstar World B, and man, it's a dump, said Zaphod, running onto the bridge. Hi, guys. You must be so amazingly glad to see me, you can't even find words to tell me what a cool fruit I am. What a what? said Arthur, blearily, picking himself up from the floor and not taking any of this in. I know how you feel. I'm so great, even I get tongue-tied talking to myself. Hey, it's good to see you, Trillian, Ford, Monkey Man. Hey, uh, computer? Hi there, Mr. Bleeblebrox, sir. Sure is a great honor to— Shut up and get us out of here fast, fast, fast. Sure thing, fella. Where do you want to go? Anywhere. Doesn't matter. Yes, it does. We want to go to the nearest place to eat. Sure thing, said the computer happily, and a massive explosion rocked the bridge. When Zani Whoop entered a minute or so later with a black eye, he regarded the four wisps of smoke with interest. Four inert bodies sank through spinning blackness. Consciousness had died. Cold oblivion pulled the bodies down and down into the pit of unbeing. The roar of silence echoed dismally around them, and they sank at last into a dark and bitter sea of heaving red that slowly engulfed them, seemingly forever. After what seemed an eternity, the sea receded and left them lying on a cold, hard shore, the flotsam and jetsam of the stream of life, the universe, and everything. Cold spasms shook them, lights danced sickeningly around them, the cold hard shore tipped and span and then stood still. It shone darkly. It was a very highly polished cold hard shore. A green blur watched them disapprovingly. It coughed. <clears throat> Good evening, madam, gentlemen. Do you have a reservation? Reservation, said Ford weakly. Yes, sir. Do you need a reservation for the afterlife? Afterlife, sir? Arthur Dent was grappling with his consciousness the way one grapples with a lost bar of soap in the bath. Is this the afterlife? I mean, there's no way we, we could have survived that blast, is there? A dull, hoarse gurgling sound came from the floor. It was Zaphod Beeblebrox attempting to speak. I certainly didn't survive. I was a total goner. Wham, bang, and that was it. If the lady and gentleman would care to order drinks, kapow, splat, instantaneously zonked into our component molecules. Hey, Ford, did you get that thing of your whole life flashing before you? You got that too, your whole life? Yeah, at least I assume it was mine. I spend a lot of time out of my skulls, you know. So, here we are lying dead, er, uh, standing dead, in this desolate five-star restaurant. Odd, isn't it, said Ford. 
Hey, I think we're missing some ultra-important thing here, you know? Something somebody said and we missed it. The green blur, who had by this time resolved into the shape of a small, wizened, dark-suited green waiter, said, Perhaps you would care to discuss the matter over drinks. Drinks! That was it! See what you miss if you don't stay alert? Indeed, sir. If the lady and gentleman would care to take drinks before dinner, and the universe will explode later for your pleasure. Ford's head swiveled slowly towards him. Wow! What sort of drinks do you serve in this place? Ah, I think sir has perhaps misunderstood me. It is not unusual for our customers to be a little disorientated by the time journey, so if I might suggest... Time journey, said Zaphod, Ford and Trillian all at once. You mean this isn't the afterlife? The waiter smiled a polite little waiter's smile. Afterlife, sir? No, sir. And we're not dead? Aha! Uh -huh. Ha! Sir is most evidently alive, otherwise I would not attempt to serve, sir. Hey, guys! This is crazy! We did it! We finally got to where we were going! This is Millieways, the restaurant at the end of the universe! Well, when did that end? said Arthur. In just a few minutes, sir, said the waiter. Now, if you would care to order your drinks at last, I will then show you to your table. Zaphod grinned two manic grins, sauntered over to the bar, and bought most of it. The restaurant at the end of the universe is one of the most extraordinary ventures in the entire history of catering. It is built on the fragmented remains of an eventually ruined planet which is enclosed in a vast time bubble and projected forward in time to the precise moment of the end of the universe. This is, many would say, impossible. You can arrive for any sitting you like without prior reservation because you can book retrospectively, as it were, when you return to your own time. This is, many would now insist, absolutely impossible. At the restaurant, you can meet and dine with a fascinating cross-section of the entire population of space and time. This, it can be explained patiently, is also impossible. You can visit it as many times as you like and be sure of never meeting yourself because of the embarrassment this usually causes. This, even if the rest were true, which it isn't, is patently impossible, say the doubters. All you have to do is deposit one penny in a savings account in your own era, and when you arrive at the end of time, the operation of compound interest means that the fabulous cost of your meal has been paid for. This, many claim, is not merely impossible, but clearly insane, which is why the advertising executives of the star system of Bastablon came up with this slogan. If you've done six impossible things this morning, why not round it off with breakfast at Millieways, the restaurant at the end of the universe? Wow, we Zappo! Incredible! The people! The things! The things are also people. The end of the universe is very popular. People like to dress up for it. Gives it a sense of occasion. The tables were fanned out in a large circle around a central stage area where a small band were playing light music. At least a thousand tables was Arthur's guess, and interspersed amongst them were swaying palms, hissing fountains, grotesque statuary, in short, all the paraphernalia common to all restaurants where little expense has been spared to give the impression that no expense had been spared. Hey, everybody's here, you know, everybody who was anybody. Was, said Arthur. At the end of the universe, you have to use the past tense a lot, cause everything's been done, you know. Hey, Zephod, said Ford, there's an old mate of mine, Hot Black Desiato. See the man at the platinum table with a platinum suit on? Oh, yeah. Hey, did that guy ever make it mega big? Wow, bigger than the biggest thing ever. Other than me. Well, who is he supposed to be? asked Trillian. Hot black Desiato? You don't know? You never heard of disaster area? No, said Trillian, who hadn't. 
the biggest, said Ford, loudest, richest rock band in the history of, of, he searched for the word, history itself, said Zephard. Ford waded off through the throng to renew an old acquaintance. Hey, uh, hot black, how you doing? Great to see you, big boy. How's the noise? You're looking great. <laughs> really very, very fat and unwell. Amazing. He slapped the man on the back and was mildly surprised that it seemed to elicit no response. Remember the old days? We used to hang out, right? The bistro illegal, remember? Slim's throat emporium. The evil drone boozerama. Great days, eh? And when we were hungry, we'd pose as public health inspectors, you remember that? And go around confiscating meals and drinks, right? Till we got food poisoning. Oh, and then there were the long nights of talking and drinking in those smelly rooms above the Café Lou in Gretchen Town, New Bethel. And you were always in the next room trying to write songs on your agitar. And we all hated them. And you said you didn't care, and we said we did because we hated them so much. Ford's eyes were beginning to mist over. And you said you didn't want to be a star because you despised despised the star system, and we said, Hadra and Suliju and me, that we didn't think you had the option. And what do you do now? You buy star systems. What's that number you do? Something, and, and in the stage act you do, it ends up with this ship crashing right into the sun, and you actually do it. Ship, sun, wham, bang! I mean, forget lasers and stuff. You guys are into solar flares and real sunburn. Oh, and terrible songs. Hey, hey, you want a drink? It began to sink into his squelching mind that something was missing from this reunion, and that the missing something was in some way connected with the fact that the fat man sitting opposite him in the platinum suit and the silvery trilby had not yet said, Hi, Ford, or great to see you after all this time, or in fact, anything at all. More to the point, he had not even moved. Hot black? A large, meaty hand landed on his shoulder from behind and pushed him aside. Kid, beat it. Oh, yeah? said Ford. And who are you? I am Mr. Desiato's bodyguard, and I am responsible for his body, and I am not responsible for yours, so take it away before it gets damaged. Now, wait a minute. No minutes. No waiting. Mr. Desiato speaks to no one. Why? said Ford. What's the matter with him? The bodyguard told him. Ford staggered back to the table where Zephod, Arthur, and Trillian were sitting waiting for the fun to begin. Hi, Ford. You speak to the big noise boy? Hot Black? Yeah, I sort of spoke to him, yeah. What did he say? Well, not a lot, really. He's, um, he's spending a year dead for tax reasons. I've got to sit down. The waiter approached. Would you like to see the menu, he said, or would you like to meet the dish of the day? Ah, uh, that's cool, said Zephard. We'll meet the meat. In the restaurant, the lights dimmed. The band quickened its pace. A single spotlight stabbed down into the darkness of the stairway that led up to the center of the stage. Up the stairs bounded a tall, brilliantly colored figure. He burst onto the stage, tripped lightly up to the microphone, removed it from its stand with one swoop of his long, thin hand, and stood for a moment bowing left and right to the audience, acknowledging their applause and displaying to them his bay window. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. The universe as we know it has now been in existence for over 170,000 million billion years and we'll be ending in a little over half an hour. So welcome one and all to Millie Ways, the restaurant at the end of the universe.
I am your host for tonight. My name is Max Cordelpleen, and I've just come straight from the very other end of time where I've been hosting a show at the Big Bang Burger Bar, where I can tell you we had a very exciting evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I will be with you right through this historic occasion, the end of history itself. So, ladies and gentlemen, the candles are lit. The band plays softly, and as the four-shielded dome above us fades into transparency, revealing a dark and sullen sky hung heavy with the ancient light of livid, swollen stars, I can see we're all in for a fabulous evening's apocalypse. Even the soft tootling of the band faded away as stunned shock descended on all those who had not seen this sight before. A monstrous, grisly light poured in on them. The universe was coming to an end. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be back with you again in just a moment. And meanwhile, I leave you in the very capable hands of Mr. Reg Nullify and his cataclysmic combo. Big hand, please, ladies and gentlemen, for Reg and the boys. The baleful turmoil of the skies continued. Hesitantly, the audience began to clap, and after a moment or so, normal conversation resumed. Max began his round of the tables, swapping jokes, shouting with laughter, earning his living. A large dairy animal approached Zaphod Beeblebrox's table, a large, fat, meaty quadruped of the bovine type with large, watery eyes, small horns, and what might almost have been an ingratiating smile on its lips. Good evening. I'm the main dish of the day. May I interest you in parts of my body? Its gaze was met by looks of startled bewilderment from Arthur and Trillian, a resigned shrug from Ford Prefect, and naked hunger from Zaphod Beeblebrox. Something off the shoulder, perhaps, braised in a white wine sauce. Uh... "'Your shoulder?' said Arthur, in a horrified whisper. "'But naturally my shoulder, sir. Nobody else's is mine to offer.' Zaphod leapt to his feet and started prodding and feeling the animal's shoulder appreciatively. "'Or oh, the rump is very good. I've been exercising it and eating plenty of grain, so there's a lot of good meat there. Or a casserole of me, perhaps?' "'You mean this animal actually wants us to eat it?' whispered Trillian to Ford. "'That's absolutely horrible! The most revolting thing I've ever heard! "'What's the problem, Earthman? "'I just don't want to eat an animal that's standing there inviting me to,' said Arthur. "'It's heartless!' "'Better than eating an animal that doesn't want to be eaten.' "'That's not the point,' Arthur protested. "'I think I'll just have a green salad,' he muttered. "'May I urge you to consider my liver?' It must be very rich and tender by now. I've been force-feeding myself for months. Are you going to tell me, said Arthur, that I shouldn't have a green salad? Well, I know many vegetables that are very clear on that point, which is why it was eventually decided to cut through the whole tangled problem and breed an animal that actually wanted to be eaten and was capable of saying so clearly and distinctly, and here I am. Glass of water, please, said Arthur. Look, we want to eat. We don't want to make a meal of the issues. Four rare steaks, please, and hurry. We haven't eaten in 576,000 million years. A very wise choice, uh, if I may say so. Very good. I'll just nip off and shoot myself. He turned and gave a friendly wink to Arthur. Don't worry, sir. I'll be very humane. It waddled unhurriedly off to the kitchen. A matter of minutes later, the waiter arrived with four huge steaming steaks. Zaphod and Ford wolfed straight into them without a second's hesitation. Trillian paused, then shrugged, and started into hers. Arthur stared at his, feeling slightly ill. "'Hey, Earthman,' said Zaphod, with a malicious grin on the face that wasn't stuffing itself. "'What's eating you?' All around the restaurant, people and things relaxed and chatted. 
for an infinite number of miles in every direction, the universal cataclysm was gathering to a stupefying climax. Glancing at his watch, Max returned to the stage with a flourish. And now, ladies and gentlemen, is everyone having one last wonderful time? Well, that's wonderful, enthused Max. Absolutely wonderful. And as the photon storms gather in swirling crowds around us, preparing to tear apart the last of the red-hot suns, I know you're all going to settle back and enjoy with me what I know we will all find an immensely exciting and terminal experience. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing penultimate about this one. This really is the absolute end. The final chilling desolation in which the whole majestic sweep of creation becomes extinct. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the proverbial it. After this, there is nothing. Void. Emptiness, oblivion, absolute nothing. Nothing? Except, of course, for the sweet trolley and a fine selection of Aldebaran liqueurs. And for once, you don't need to worry about having a hangover in the morning because there won't be any more mornings. And now, at the risk of putting a damper on the wonderful sense of doom and futility here this evening, I would like to welcome a few parties. Do we have a party here from the Zansel Quasia Flammarium Bridge Club from beyond the Vort Void of Quan? Are they here? A rousing cheer came from the back. Ah, oh, there they are. And do we also have, do we have a party of minor deities from the halls of Asgard? Away to his right came a rumble of thunder. Lightning arced across the stage. A small group of hairy men with helmets sat looking very pleased with themselves and raised their glasses to him. Has beans, he thought to himself. Uh, careful with that hammer, sir. And thirdly, a party of young conservatives from Sirius B. Are they here? A party of smartly dressed young dogs stopped throwing rolls at each other and started throwing rolls at the stage. They yapped and barked unintelligibly. Yes, said Max. Well, this is all your fault. You realise that? And finally, I believe we have with us here tonight a party of believers, very devout believers from the Church of the Second Coming of the Great Prophet Zarquan. There were about twenty of them sitting right out on the edge of the floor, ascetically dressed, sipping mineral water nervously, and staying apart from the festivities. They blinked resentfully as the spotlight was turned on them. There they are, sitting there, patiently. He said he'd come again, and he's kept you waiting a long time, so let's hope he's hurrying, fellas, because he's only got eight minutes left. <laughs> No, no, but seriously, though, folks, seriously, though, no offence, man. No, no, I know we shouldn't make fun of deeply held beliefs, so I think a big hand, please, for the great prophet Zarquan, wherever he's got to. It's marvellous, though, to see so many of you here tonight. No, isn't it, though? Yes, absolutely marvellous, because I know that so many of you come here time and time again, which I think is really wonderful to come and watch this final end of everything and then return home to your own eras and raise families, strive for new and better societies, fight terrible wars for what you know to be right. Well, it really gives one hope for the future of all life kind, except, of course, that we know it hasn't got one. Tipping back his chair, Ford collided with a small green waiter who was approaching the table, carrying a portable telephone. Mr. Zephod Beeblebrox, there is a phone call for you. For me? Here? Hey, but who knows where I am? I am not personally acquainted with the metal gentleman in question, sir. Did you say metal? Uh, yes, sir, I said that I am not personally acquainted with the metal gentleman in question, but I am informed that he has been awaiting your return for a considerable number of millennia. It seems you left here somewhat precipitately. Left here? 
Are you being strange? We, we only just arrived here. Indeed, sir. But before you arrived here, sir, I understand that you left here. You're saying that before we arrived here, we left here? This is going to be a long night, thought the waiter. Precisely, sir. Put your analyst on danger money, baby, advised Zephod. No, wait a minute, said Ford, emerging above table level again. Where exactly is here? To be absolutely exact, sir, it is Frogstar World B. But we just left there and came to the restaurant at the end of the universe. Yes, sir. The one was constructed on the ruins of the other. Oh, said Arthur brightly. You mean we've traveled in time, but not in space? Listen, you semi-evolved simian, go climb a tree, will you? Go bang your heads together, four eyes. No, no, your monkey has got it right, sir. You jumped forward, I believe, 576,000 million years while staying in exactly the same place. But uh, who is the cat on the phone? Whatever happened to Marvin, said Trillian. The paranoid android I left him moping about on Frogstar B. Hey, uh, hand me the rap rod, plate captain. I beg your pardon, sir. The phone, waiter. She, <laughs> you guys are so unhip, it's a wonder your bums don't fall off. Indeed, sir. Hey, Marvin, is that you? said Zaphod into the phone. How you doing, kid? I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed. Hey, Marvin, we're having a great time. Food, wine, a little personal abuse, and the universe going foom. Where can we find you? You don't have to pretend to be interested in me, you know. I know perfectly well I'm only a menial robot. Okay, okay, but where are you? Reverse primary thrust, Marvin, that's what they say to me. Open airlock number three, Marvin. Marvin, can you pick up that piece of paper? Can I pick up that piece of paper? Here I am, brain the size of a planet, and they ask me... To... Yeah, yeah. But I'm quite used to being humiliated. I can even go and stick my head in a bucket of water if you like. Would you like me to go and stick my head in a bucket of water? I've got one ready. Wait a minute. Sad little clanks and gurgles came up the line. There. I hope that gave satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. Now will you please tell us where you are? I'm in the car park. The car park? What are you doing there? Parking cars. What else does one do in a car park? Okay, hang in there. We'll be right down. In one movement, Zaphod leapt to his feet, threw down the phone, and wrote Hot Black Desiato on the bill. Come on, guys, he said. Marvin's in the car park. Let's get on down. But what about the end of the universe? We'll miss the big moment. I've seen it. It's rubbish, said Zaphod. Nothing but a nab gib. A what? Opposite of Big Bang. Come on, let's get zappy. Few of the other diners paid them any attention as they weaved their way through the restaurant to the exit. A serious cybernetics corporation happy vertical people transporter took them down deep into the substrata beneath the restaurant. At the bottom of the shaft, the lift doors opened and a blast of cold, stale air hit them. They turned a corner and found themselves on a moving catwalk that traversed a vast, cavernous space that stretched off into the dim distance. There he is, said Trillian. Marvin, down there. They looked where she was pointing. Dimly they could see a small metal figure listlessly rubbing a small rag on one remote corner of a giant silver sun cruiser. Hey, Marvin! Hey, kid! Are we pleased to see you? No, you're not. No one ever is. Suit yourself, said Zephyr, and turned away to ogle the ships. Ford went with him. Only Trillian and Arthur actually went up to Marvin. No, we really are, said Trillian, and patted him in a way that he disliked intensely. Hanging around, waiting for us all this time. Five hundred and seventy-six thousand million three thousand five hundred and seventy-nine years. I counted them. Well, here we are now. The first ten million years were the worst, and the second ten million years, they were the worst too. The third ten million I didn't enjoy at all. After that I went into a bit of a decline. It's the people you meet in this job that really get you down. 
The best conversation I had was over 40 million years ago. Oh, did I... And that was with a coffee machine. That's a... You don't like talking to me, do you? Trillian talked to Arthur instead. Further down the chamber, Ford Prefect had found something of which he very much liked the look. Zaphod, he said in a quiet voice, just look at this baby. The tangerine star buggy with the black sunbusters. The star buggy was a small ship, a totally misnamed one, in fact, because the one thing it couldn't manage was interstellar distances. The next one was a big one and thirty yards long, a coach-built limo ship and obviously designed with one aim in mind, that of making the beholder sick with envy. Just look at it, said Zephod. Multi-cluster quark drive, perspulex running boards. Got to be a Laszlar Lyrican custom job. Yeah, look, the infrapink lizard emblem on the neutrino cowling. Laszlar's trademark. The man has no shame. I was passed by one of these mothers once out by the Axel Nebula, said Ford. I was going flat out, and this thing just strolled past me. Star drive hardly ticking over. Just incredible. Ten seconds later, said Ford, it smashed straight into the third moon of Jaglin Beta. Hey, come see, he called. There's a big mural painted on this side. A bursting sun. Disaster areas, trademark. This must be hot black ship. Lucky old bugger. They do this terrible song, you know, which ends with a stunt ship crashing into the sun. Meant to be an amazing spectacle. Expensive in stunt ships, though. Zaphod's attention, however, was elsewhere. His attention was riveted on the ship standing next to hot black Desiato's limo. That is really bad for the eyes. Ford looked. He, too, stood astonished. It was a ship of classic, simple design, like a flattened salmon, twenty yards long, very clean, very sleek. There was just one remarkable thing about it. It's so black. You can hardly make out its shape. Light just seems to fall into it. Zaphod said nothing. He had simply fallen in love. Come and feel this surface, he said in a hushed voice. See, it's just totally frictionless. This must be one mother of a mover. What do you reckon, Ford? You mean, uh, you mean, stroll off with it? They gazed a little longer, till Zaphod suddenly pulled himself together. We'd better shift soon, he said. In a moment or so, the universe will have ended and all the captain creeps will be pouring down here to find their borge mobiles. Marvin, come on over here. We've got a job for you. I suppose you want me to open this spaceship for you. What? Uh, uh yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I wish you'd just tell me rather than try to engage my enthusiasm, because I haven't got one. He walked up to the ship, touched it, and a hatchway swung open. Ford and Zaphod stared at the opening. Don't mention it. Oh, you didn't. He trudged away again. Look at this, said Ford. Look at the interior of this ship. Weirder and weirder. It's black, said Ford. Everything in it is just totally black. In the restaurant, things were fast approaching the moment after which there wouldn't be any more moments. And now, cried Max from the centre of the stage, the moment you've all been waiting for. The skies begin to boil. Nature collapses into the screaming void. In twenty seconds' time, the universe itself will be at an end. See where the light of infinity bursts in upon us? The hideous fury of destruction blazed about them, and at that moment a still small trumpet sounded as from an infinite distance. Max's eyes swiveled round to glare at the band. None of them seemed to be playing a trumpet. Suddenly a wisp of smoke was swirling and shimmering on the stage next to him. The trumpet was joined by more trumpets. Over five hundred times Max had done this show, and nothing like this had ever happened before. He drew back in alarm from the swirling smoke, 
and as he did so, a figure slowly materialized inside, the figure of an ancient man, bearded, robed, and wreathed in light. In his eyes were stars, and on his brow a golden crown. What's this? What's happening? At the back of the restaurant, the stony-faced party from the Church of the Second Coming of the Great Prophet Zarquan leapt ecstatically to their feet, chanting and crying. Max blinked in amazement. He threw up his arms to the audience. A big hand, please, ladies and gentlemen, for the Great Prophet Zarquan. He has come. Zarquan has come again. Thunderous applause broke out as Max strode across the stage and handed his microphone to the prophet. Uh, <coughs> uh hello. Um, uh, look, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a bit late. I've, I've had the most ghastly time. All sorts of things cropping up at the last moment. Uh, <coughs> how are we for time? Have I just got a min? And so the universe ended. Thank you.